This is the feast of the Lord, and it's called first fruits. Okay, now, before we get, uh, and we will, we're going to... We're going to look at this through the scriptures today, how Jesus Christ has fulfilled this third feast, the Feast of First Fruits. Okay, now, before we get into First Fruits properly, there is, there is some confusion over First Fruits and First Fruits Feast of Weeks Shavuot. Because on both of these holy days, people bring to the temple their first fruits. Okay, but as we are going to learn today, okay... There is one first fruits festival proper, which is two days properly after Passover. It's on the third day, okay, of unleavened bread. This is very symbolic and prophetic and valuable for us for very reason, for multiple reasons, which we will all cover through the scriptures today. Again, that day, Yoma, Yom means day. So what's the day of atonement? Atonement is Kippur, Kippuret, Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. Okay, so Yom Bikorim is the first fruits, the day of first fruits. Now, the, the first fruit that's offered here, the first fruit to come, is not a fruit at all. It's a grain. Okay, first fruits, you know, that, that word is, uh, there, there's a little leverage there in the word first fruits, meaning that when you get paycheck, when you get paid, the first fruits of your paycheck is a tithe. It means the first fruit that comes forth, births forth. And in this, uh, let's go to Exodus 23, by the way. Let's start here. Let's start and get grounded in the word where this all began. Now, by the way, we're learning about Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits today. All of these feasts are also chronologically synchronized to creation. For an example, gosh, what if I, what if I'm on some, you know, what if I'm in some faraway land and I, you know, my enemy burned up my Torah and I don't have a local calendar? How am I going to know when it's Passover? Very simple. Springtime. You know when it's springtime, the, the seasons change, the crops come forth, little green leaves start budding forth. That's the new year. But that's the first biblical new year is Passover, which is Exodus. That's when we exited slavery. A new life, the old life comes to an end of slavery. The new life comes to beginning of sonship. You are now sons and daughters of God. Amen? Okay, so new life, new spirit. Well, gosh, you know, we're, we, we're people of symbols, right? It's like I want, I want something. To, I'm going to get a piece of jewelry. Some people are like, I want a tattoo to remember this. All right, we need to make a celebration. Well, you know what? The Lord, look at creation. New things happen. Behold, I do a new thing. And it's, and it's it strings out before you. Can't you see? Can't you see even the new trees are coming forth? Can't you see the dead trees are coming alive? This is the remarkable synchronization of the Lord. And I'm, I'm glad that he did this because there's so much value in being able to look in the natural realm to see what the spiritual realm is, is saying, right? The Bible says all of creation, it's not hidden. There's no language where this is hidden from. In other words, it doesn't matter if you speak Dutch, Chinese, German, Russian, Indonesian, Papua New Guinean. And you can see a green bud coming forth. It's international, right? Awesome. Okay, so the first crop to mature, does anyone want to take a guess at what it is? It's what? A grain. It is grain. It is a grain. And which one is it? Barley. Barley. Very good. Barley is the very first. So let's read Exodus. Kevin, why don't you read that to us? Exodus 23, 19. Now, by the way, this is really going to make sense. I thank you, Lord, for the spirit of revelation. I want you to know that before there was barley in the land, there was what? Be so, okay, we leave Egypt, and they're in the desert. There's no barley, but the first fruit started that first week we left Egypt. It was symbolic. This was really going to come to a head. It was going to be a... a what's called a prophetic fulfillment. It is when something is prophesied and it comes to pass. This is huge, huge, okay? And it's still, and it's even huger now. It had two fulfillments. The first fulfillment, temporary, you know what it was? We were given manna. Yeah, we don't have grain. How can we make bread? From heaven, okay? Uh, and it, this is really gonna make, Jesus is the bread of life. I am the, you know, right? They give you man and you died, but a bread I give you will live forever. He's the unleavened bread. But this, 
this manna acted as a, if you will, this was also a type and shadow. It was a temporary fulfillment for what was going to be permanent and then eternal. Okay, let's get into this. In Exodus 23, 19, Kevin, why don't you read that to us? Okay, so the first fruits that you bring into the temple, by the way, Yomi Bikurim, the, the day of first fruits, is an appointed feast, and it is the barley. It's the first crop that matures. And here's what's happening. In the scriptures, you know, we'll go on to read that it basically says during the month of Aviv, you are to basically take, you are to take a sheave of barley, right? You're to take a sheave of barley and wave it before the Lord as you present an omer of the grain flour with frankincense and oil, and that's going to be made into an offering before the Lord. But you wave it before the Lord. Now, this word aviv, it says in the month of aviv, uh, there is no month aviv, okay? There is a month of av, okay? There actually is no month of aviv. What that word aviv means is like a spring grain, a spring forth. Brand new, like you could say, like springtime, but in an agricultural setting. That Aviv is when the barley is ripe. Now, let me tell you what happens. If I take this barley, for an example, and I take my winnowing fork, okay, you ever you remember the sickle? It's just like a one handle with a metal curve. I have a picture of it, I'll show you in a minute. But if I take that sickle after Aviv, okay, and I hit the grain, uh, the grain's gonna fall out all over the place. Okay, so this is going to make sense when we start hearing language like parched and aviv. What happens is they harvest the grain when it's ripe, but not so ripe. It's kind of like there's a, there's a time on an apple tree when the apples are ready to eat and you pick them off. And if you wait too long, they fall off, right? You understand the difference? If you wait to harvest, okay, until after aviv, if you do it too late, the moment it hits the sickle or let's say you have a modern combine, it hits the thing and the grain falls out. You've just seeded your field for the next year. Oops, I wanted to eat that, not plant it, right? But if you harvest it during Aviv, it's still so ripe it won't come out. What do you have to do? You have to parch it, heat it with fire, okay, to get all the moisture out. And after that, you separate the wheat from the chaff. Okay, this language, again, this is all over the New Testament and parabolic material that they separate the wheat and the chaff. And it's talking about the righteous versus the unrighteous, the good and the evil, but that context is linked all the way back to the first fruits feast because when you separate the wheat and the chaff on the threshing floor, you separate that which is unusable for that which is usable for nourishment and so forth. Everyone with me? Okay, this feast, let's go to Leviticus 23 and 11. By the way, this is seven weeks before Pentecost, just so you know where we're at on the calendar with the Yomi Bikurim, the day of first fruits. Leviticus 23, 11. Uh, Amber, why don't you read that in the back? Leviticus 23, 11. Okay, on the day after the Sabbath, that's also very important, okay, for the fulfillment, the day after the Sabbath. Why can't you do that on the Sabbath? Because you're working, and we don't work on the Sabbath. So the day after the Sabbath, you are able to harvest the barley, okay? Now, this is congruent with, let's go, and Amber, why don't you also read Leviticus 2.15? Leviticus 2.15. Okay, so like everything, even though it's a holy day and it's a high holy day, it still falls in line with the law that the new harvest, the barley, is also a grain offering. So you wave it before the Lord, you present it with frankincense. By the way, everything was presented with frankincense and salt, okay? If you look at the offerings, you couldn't give an offering without salt, okay? 
also, and so again, when Jesus says you're the salt of the earth, it really has a lot of value. He says that in, in uh, Matthew 6, you're the salt of the earth uh, and you're the light of the world. If you're the salt and the salt is presented before God with every offering, that means that you, you can't offer to God without belief. Okay? Like someone can't, it's like they don't believe God and they say, God, why did you, you know, they complain to God, but they don't pray to him. They don't bring an offering of their life. And so then their, their life is not in the presence of God. And then when the enemy ravages them up, they say, why would a good God allow this to happen to me? You, you follow where I'm going with this. Those type of people, it's like they, they believe in God to blame him when stuff doesn't go right, but not enough to present their body as a living sacrifice and wave it before him with salt so that he would accept them and bless them and honor them in the presence of the Lord, right? You have to think about this, that when you stand, have you ever had, I'll give you an example to make sense of this. Have you ever had someone ask you to pray for them? Have you ever had someone who doesn't believe in the Lord, they don't go to church, but they're going through something hard and they love you and they go, hey, will you pray for me? You know, that's basically saying, will you take this offering in the temple for me? Kind of like, will you be a priest to me? And you know what? We are priests. In the, the nation of Israel, what was whispered to Abraham is also spoken to you again in Revelation, that you are a kingdom of kings and priests or a nation of holy people. Okay? You are holy to the Lord. Now, remember also what we learned about the, uh, the tassels, the tzitzits, that these tzitzits were to be made out of blue, which reminded us of the covering of the Ark of the Covenant and the ephod of the priests. And if everyone wears this, guess what everyone is a type and shadow of? The priest. The one who stands in, on behalf of man and God. That's what you all are. Your salt, your light. When we understand the temple and everything in the heart of God, all of these things come to light. They actually have value. Let's go to John 20, 17. John 20, 17. By the way, uh, an Omer, let me just show you a couple pictures while we're turning there. Okay, so remember I told you there's no month of Aviv. When the grain is Aviv, you are to harvest it and wave your, uh, your uh, offering before the Lord. Here's the Hebrew months, ready? Shavat, Adar, Nisan. Now Nisan is the month, okay, when first fruits and Passover and unleavened bread happen. It's all in the month of Nisan, okay? Ayar, Saivan, Tammuz, Av, Elul, Tishri, Heshvan, Kislev, and Tibet. Do you see a month of Aviv anywhere on here? No. And someone would say, that's not Aviv, it's Av. <coughs> Av is in July or August, not first fruits, not spring. That is in Nisan. So what does Aviv mean? Again, it means a ripe, it means a spring-like harvest, a fresh in other words, it's like when a peach is just turning sweet and ready to eat, but it's not like so sweet and juicy it'll fall apart, right? It's when something is ripe enough for you to eat it, but even if you, it's like you pluck it and then let it sit on the counter for a couple days, it's a banana that's more green than yellow. You follow where I'm going with this? It's in a virgin state, if you will, perfectly preserved uh, in its integrity. Okay, let's look at the next slide. Here we go. This, the guy on the left and the guy on the right, the, the left is liquid measurements, the right is solid measurements. Now you see that stone he's pouring into? Not the one. You see the second one down the line? Not the one. You see the third one down the line? That's an omer, okay? An omer is about, watch me, about the size of this temple worth of grain. This is an omer size, okay? You see that? This is an omer worth of grain. That's the offering that ultimately you would present to the Lord. It's not that much, okay? This, as a matter of fact, I'll show you how much grain this is. Um, Colette, will you help me pass these out? This is almost an, over, uh, almost an omer of barley. This is what you were supposed to bring the Lord uh, in, in flour form. They would parch it. They would separate the wheat from the chaff, and then they would grind it. And then this was presented for the Lord into flour, and they made bread out of it, okay? You remember when Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fishes? You want to take a guess at what kind of loaves those were? Barley loaves. It actually says that. Okay, before we go there, Randy, do you have John 20, 17? And Brent, you're going to go to Deuteronomy 8, 8. By the way, a food that has that many options, it's kind of like uh, bread. 
You can have bread and make, have it with a hamburger or a hot dog. You can have it with jam or peanut butter or butter. It has, or you can put frosting on it and make it a cake. You understand that bread is like universal food. Give us this day our daily bread. That's one thing that you can eat it any different way and it works in every application. Such is the case with barley, okay? But before you were to take this before the Lord, by the way, if you harvested your barley before the high priest said, will you harvest during the, after the beef, the day after Sabbath, you bring this to the temple and they, he inspects a sheave. By the way, this is called a sheave. This is about, this is a, a, a light sheave. It'd be a little heavier than this, a little bit thicker. But you bring the sheave and they wave it before the Lord like, I acknowledge that this comes from you. And so I bring it into your house and you will feed your family, the priests, with this. And we will all be blessed. And then when you bless this, guess what happens to the rest of my barley crop? It's redeemed and blessed. If I don't do that, it's cursed. Okay? And if you eat the barley before it's accepted and offered by the priest, it's no good. Okay? I mean, you're, you're disqualified. You're out. It's a curse, not a blessing. Now, Jesus Christ is the first fruits of them that slept. Okay? So he rises first. Now, the first fruits before it's eaten and enjoyed by everyone, where does it have to go? Into the temple. It has to be inspected by the high priest, the Kohanim Gadol. And he looks at it and says, yes, this is Aviv. This is right. And then all of a sudden there's a commissioning. And whoever offered it, he says, will you, will you harvest the barley? He said, yes, I will harvest the barley. Will you do it with this, with this reap, with this sickle, with this tool? Yes, I will do it with these things. He says, Amen. And, and what happens in the days of Israel, because the fields were vast and far away, they would light a signal fire, okay? They would light a signal fire here that everyone knows, it's okay, blow the whistle. Now, you could, because before that, they're ready. We're ready to go. We're waiting on permission from on high, okay? Now, let's go to, real quick, John 20, 17. That's you, Randy. Okay, when Jesus resurrects, by the way, we're going to get into this, he is the first fruit. But he cannot be eaten and enjoyed by the, in other words, eaten, enjoyed, touched, handled. You can't do that. You can't, hey, my barley's right, pass it out, give it to my mom, my brother, everyone who shared their, you know, you raise chickens, you give me some chickens, I give you some grain, and that's how our family lives. Okay, it's very practical. I can't do that until I take this sheave and go into the high priest and he authenticates my offering. After that, it's blessed. Everyone can share from my blessed crops. Before Jesus, okay, stood in the temple in heaven to present the first fruits, you can't handle him. That's what that, most people, I read that, I, I actually don't know what it means. You're resurrected. Why can't I touch you? Because he hasn't been presented. In the, remember, there's a temple in heaven. Okay, We read that in Revelation 11, verse 19. There is a temple in heaven, and until he goes to fulfill the eternal mandate, remember down here, we're all types and shadows and temporary. Up there, it's permanent. When he goes up there and permanently, he stands in front of the temple before Yah, and, and in the physical form, the spirit becomes one and fulfills that eternally, guess what happens? Then you and I can be blessed in our resurrection. There was no resurrection before Jesus. You had, I mean, a temporary one. In other words, you die, I raise you back to life, and then you die again. But you're not resurrected permanently. Remember, even Lazarus was resurrected, and he died again, like 11 years, 12 years later, you know? Right? Temporary. Jesus is permanent. Permanent resurrection. Look at Deuteronomy 8.8, 8, by the way. I don't know. You've heard milk and honey. You've probably heard milk and honey so many times that... You know, where does that come from? Well, I know the promised land is milk and honey, but where does it actually come from? Well, let's look at Deuteronomy 8.8. 8. There's more to the promised land than milk and honey. Go ahead and read that to us, Brent. Okay. So this was one of the promises. Hey. I'm going to take you into a land overflowing with, yes, there's milk and honey, but there's pomegranates. And fi by the way, have you ever looked at like any type of Israeli cookware, dishes, 
you know, even when we went, we went to the Dead Sea Scrolls exhibit, and you go in there, and they have all those books on food, and they have some, like, cake plates. And all of them have pomegranates everywhere. It's like, what is this all about? That was one of the promised land rewards. You'll have pomegranates, grapes, figs, dates. You will also have barley, okay? You will have barley to satisfy with your daily bread. That bread is made out of barley. So barley is a reward from God. Okay, let's go to John 6, 9. A boy with what? Five small barley loaves. Okay. Five loaves and two fishes. Everyone knows, that even people who don't read the Bible know, well, yeah, there's five loaves and two fishes. I think there's songs and plays about that. But if you to take to the next level, what kind of loaves were those? I don't know. Okay. Until today. They were barley loaves. Okay. They were part of the first fruits blessed crop. How do you make barley loaves? I'll give you a hint. You have to start with barley flour. How do you get the barley flour? After the sheave has been weighed before the Lord. Oh, you got saved? How'd you get saved? Because I believed in what Jesus Christ did. What did Jesus Christ do? He was the first fruits of those that slept. He resurrected. If he died on the cross and didn't resurrect, you're not saved. Because he's not holy. He's not the first fruit. There's no fruit, in other words. There's only an end, not a beginning. Aren't you glad that your end is really your beginning? That God on the cross, the end of the natural, the beginning of the eternal supernatural. This is wonderful. Let's go to Exodus 23. Exodus 23, verse 1. Exodus 23, 9 through 14. Bradley, that's you. Exodus, I'm sorry, Leviticus 23, forgive me. Leviticus 23, 9 through 14. In Exodus 23, there's a promise to enter into the promised land, okay? Now, now we're talking about literally the command to keep first fruits in the promised land. Leviticus 23, verses 9 through 14. Here we go. Okay, the parched grain, you know, in other words, you can't heat it up by fire and move on the process until you've gone before the Lord. Until you go before the Lord to authenticate your activity, you are not legally permitted to move forward. Now, let's go to John chapter 20, verse 1. By the way, the first fruits, you couldn't take your sheave into the temple on the Sabbath. That's a day of rest. On the day after the Sabbath, the first fruits is presented, okay? That's when it is seen publicly the day after the Sabbath, okay? So this would be like Sunday is to Saturday. Now in John 20, verse 1, as it touches the resurrection, now on the first day of the week, by the way, the first day of the week is Sunday after the Sabbath. The day after the Sabbath, you present the first fruits to see the first fruits, on the day after Sabbath, guess who sees Jesus? On the first of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still, still dark and saw that the stone was taken away. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken him out of the tomb. We don't know where they've laid him. Okay? On the first day of the week, Sunday, that is when first fruits begins. Okay? Two days after the Passover Okay, Passover, for an example, would be Wednesday. Uh, let's say day of preparation, Tuesday. Passover day, Wednesday. Right? Okay, then Wednesday into Wednesday night. Say Jesus goes into the tomb. The first day would be Wednesday night to Thursday night. The second day, Thursday night to Friday night. 
the third day, Friday night to Saturday night, and guess what happens on Saturday night at sunset? It begins the first day. And guess when Jesus is resurrected? He's seen now on the first day. And on the third day he rose again, that's that Sunday. That is the day of first fruits. It's the day after the Sabbath. Okay? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 23. Courtney, will you read that to us? Okay, first you have to wave the, the sheave of barley before the high priest. Then it's blessed. It's, it's, I see with my own eyes that the barley has come forth in the land of promise. Now all the other barley may be harvested. It may come forth. First, Jesus Christ resurrects from the dead, fulfills the Yome Bikorim, and then after that, we are able to take our sickle and to go harvest, okay? Now we are able to resurrect from the dead because we have been made clean by who? The blood of the lamb. As it refers to atonement, I can, my, my blood is atoned for because the blood of the lamb is on my door. As it comes to first fruits, why do you get to resurrect? Because Jesus made all of us holy to the Lord when he waved himself before the temple. When he presented himself, okay, when he was offered up, you have to wave it. What does that mean? It has to be disconnected from the earth. Think about this. Here's the, hey, look at my barley. Don't, don't mess it up. Just look. You know, don't touch. Nope. I have to take the sheave and I have to bring it and wave it before the Lord, disconnected from the earth. Why do you think Jesus, after he died, he had to ascend up? I have not yet gone to my father. Don't touch me. Don't touch me until I'm authenticated as having been raised from the dead. And once I do, so are you. After that, after Christ, the first fruits. It means you and I are able to go in after he's gone in. Okay? To the, any one of the like whole foods, uh, vitamin shop, and you're eating real healthy, you see that Ezekiel 4-9 bread? They, now they have Ezekiel 4-9 tortillas and Ezekiel everything. Well, it's interesting. You know what Ezekiel 4-9 is? Ezekiel 4.9 is, and you shall take wheat and barley, beans and lentils, mill and emmer, and put them into a single vessel and make bread. Okay? So it is a multi-grain, if you will, it's a multi-grain bread. But the grain that is the first, the first and most valuable grain, I would say, is the barley. Because without the barley, you can't make the rest of the bread. Without that barley flour, in excess, there is no, there is no bread. And by the way, this is, this barley loaf was the loaves and the fishes. It was Ezekiel's loaf. It was the flour and the bread in the temple. The grain offering in the temple was made out of barley, okay? So barley is huge, and what's huge about barley is it points to the first fruits. And the first fruits is the barley. It is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. His resurrection literally fulfills when would it make sense for Jesus Christ to raise from the dead, to be the first fruits of them that slept? On first fruits. In other words, there's never been a permanent resurrection ever in the history of the world. Jesus Christ resurrects eternally. He is the first fruits of those that sleep. Okay? Of those that sleep, he is the first fruits, fulfilling this feast. Now, they have this feast every single year for thousands of years. Now, when the Messiah comes, again, how am I going to know if it's he? Because these feasts, you know what they really are? These feasts are like a landing strip for an airplane. And they have paint. They have, uh, they have nomenclature, letters and numbers to let the plane know where to land. Okay? In other words, it's a runway to secure that which will be to that which is. Okay? Let me show you a few more pictures here. This is them now. Getting, look at the sickle in his left hand. He's getting ready now to harvest all the barley. Okay, What you're seeing on there is barley. What you have now in your possession 
is the fruit, okay? That is the fruit of the barley. Here is sheaves put together. Remember I said that this one is a little slim for how big they would be? Those are the size of regular sheaves that you would take and present before the living God. I just want to show this to all of our friends at home. Okay. All right. And here is from the Temple Institute. This is the sickle. Okay. This is a sickle and a, a, sheave, a sheaving pot so that when you have the sheaves and you sickle and you start the process, that's what ends up catching the kernel or the fruit or the grain, which is the barley, which is what you now have. Okay? Now, and here's the Beth HaMikdash. Here's the temple where this would be presented in, in the inner court. You actually had to enter into this place, leave your comfort, leave your home, leave your farm, and you also had to trust by me presenting this to the Lord that, that he is going to provide for the rest. He's going to bless the rest by you doing this. Keep in mind, by me leaving my farm, going there, presenting for the Lord, uh, a rain, uh, I, I'm ready to harvest now. I can't wait. What if a storm comes? The weather's changing. What if an enemy comes? If you trust that you present your first part to the Lord, he will bless the rest. And this is a sign that you trust God with the very fruit of your life. I know that for us, we just go to the store and buy bread. For us, it's a paycheck that is our livelihood, right? in various different forms. But to the farmer, the bread is his livelihood, okay? Think about a couple hundred years ago, everyone had their own farm. Now they're subsidized and they're, now instead of 10 people having 10 farms, there's one farm that's 10 times the size and nine people do other stuff, okay? So now, you know, we've, we're kind of almost detaching from this, but there's a lot of scriptures that's gonna plug in this idea. An example is the tithe. It is a portion from your field, okay, of livelihood. So uh, without any more, we will, we will save the rest for next week. We're going to have communion right now.